Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. Are you looking for a way to connect with your loved one? Maybe an activity to do the next time you visit? Something other than sitting around and answering the same questions over and over again like we always seem to do? Let me tell you about some books that I discovered that changed the last visit I had with mom tremendously. They're called Two Lap Books. They are simple, read aloud books for memory challenged adults. You see, people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementias gradually lose their ability to initiate communication with others. Because of this, these uniquely adapted books, quote, give voice to these loved ones. By using the book's large, simple text and colorful illustrations, we can initiate conversations. Most noteworthy, reading books together can make meaningful connections with our loved ones and help stimulate their mind. Caregivers will enjoy sharing these books and creating purposeful, interactive activities for engaging people with memory deficits. Best of all, reading these books together will very likely bring out memories that you can share together. I've made it super easy for you guys to check out these books. The link to the Amazon page is in the show notes, so give it a click. I know you and your loved ones will get a tremendous amount of enjoyment together reading these books. Mom enjoyed them, her friends enjoyed them, and I enjoyed an afternoon with them like I haven't had in a very long time. With the winter months coming, Mom and I won't be able to go outside on our little adventures, so we'll definitely be reading these books a lot more as the colder weather envelops us and keeps us inside. Our Health Care Sucks was the name of the Instagram account that led me to Tiffany Matthews, a health care advocate and a super passionate woman on the topic. If you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's episode, go back and listen to that one first because this is the second half of my passionate and lengthy conversation with Tiffany. In this conversation, Tiffany helps us understand the hurdles and ways of navigating our healthcare system and the benefits an advocate can have for your care and your outcome if you have a health crisis. It doesn't have to be a paid person. It can be a family member, a friend, a volunteer from the community, but whoever it is, a healthcare advocate is super important. Now, let's jump back into the conversation with Tiffany and learn the rest of what we need to know to be good healthcare consumers. And that is the way it works. It, it's going to work that way as long as we have a system that supports quantity over quality of care. As long as we have that, that's the way it is. It permeates elder care. It permeates all the different systems that are related to health care, you know, and it's just a, it's a tragedy. It's an American tragedy. And I know that sounded cliche, but it truly is. It's really very sad. You know, people pay hundreds, thousands of dollars a month just to have insurance. Then you've got to pay the deductible. And then you've got to pay the cover charge to go see the doctor, which is your copay. Yep. And none of that goes towards your deductible and coinsurance and this and that. I remember a time where I went to a doctor. It was either Blue Cross or something else. And that was it. How's the family? How's everything going? That was part of our doctor's appointment. You know, oh, I saw your grandmother at the grocery store. Now you're lucky if you get a good five minutes. So patients and caregivers have to be prepared. They have to know what they need to ask, addressing issues in that five to seven minutes you get with the doctor. It's sad. Everybody will suffer because of it. And I'm just trying to do my little part to make sure that patients and caregivers know, hey, listen, it doesn't have to go that way. You know, so forgive me for talking your ear off about it, but I'm, I, I really, this gets my blood pumping. I love this stuff. Okay. You know? well, so, so give us the cliff notes version and I'm showing my age again there. Cause I'm not even sure they have those anymore, but I had cliff notes, no worries. <laughs> okay. I don't know about these younger kids. They probably don't They have the internet, but, um, oh, so 
what, like, give us three tips on what we should do to help. You know, like I said, my mom is in advanced Alzheimer's. So what -hmm. about people whose family members are in the earlier stages so it's more difficult to prevent doctors from just trying to discuss everything with them. Does that make sense? I I like to leave the medical to the doctors and that's about it. Whatever they say has to fit into your life, you know, Mm -hmm. make sure a, that your mind is open because that that's my first tip overall, because in order to learn health literacy or learn what's going on and being more powerful in, you know, a caregiver being more powerful in their um, loved one's care and treatment, you got to open your mind up. It's not going to go the way you think it should. That's just life. That is true. But it's not even in healthcare, even when you are set on a goal, you have to be open minded to flex that goal. Just keep your eye on the prize and keep going toward that. It may go down a different street than you're used to in that town, you know, but as long as you get to the goal, that's it. So keep your mind open for suggestions, thoughts, recommendations from the medical provider and possibly from, you know, resources you may find on the outside. Every disease has a support group. So they know what is going on. You can contact them and say, hey, what do you know? What do you know? Can I come out to your meeting? Do you have a meeting online? Any of those things. So keep your mind open. Now, that's a good tip. Huh? That's a very good tip because I'm, I'm thinking back to when my sister and I were dealing with my dad. And she and I are polar opposite personalities, which can be challenging in itself. But, you know, we were, I don't think we had time to even think about, you know, well, this is the outcome we'd like, but if not, then what? Because it was kind of an emergency all at once. Right. I fortunately am a huge planner. So when I realized in my mind, I was, I was certain that his, his memory was not going to come back. And Mm. I started doing, you know, I started looking around like, what the heck are we going to do? And, you know, that was harder for her just because her personality, she was more positive. She was hopeful that, you know, dad's memory would come back and all that good stuff. So I don't think she spent as much time thinking about alternatives like you're suggesting. So I I can see that as a really good suggestion. Mm -hmm. I give suggestions that people don't normally think of. When they think of wanting to change their health care, they don't think they have to change anything within themselves first. It's just, okay, let's go jump on the doctor's Mercedes and jump on it until he gives us the answer we want. No, you got to open your mind up, you know, first. Second, you know, depending on what you're dealing with, what is your plan? Who's going to help you? How are you going to, you know, how are you going to um, figure out what you need to do in order to help your loved one or your own disease? I'm a diabetic. When it happened, the first thing I did was run out and get a bunch of jelly donuts. <laughs> okay. I know so many not, people that do that. They find out they're not, diabetic. They have one last sugar binge. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, it had to happen. Skittles, everything. <laughs> And I'm not saying that's right, but it was my way of coping when I heard that. So I was like, all right, I've got to get serious. What do I need to do here? Educate yourself. You have to educate yourself on your disease, who can treat it, and where it can be treated. People have to figure out that, okay, in my family, we have this, this, and this disease. Okay, some of them need regular treatment like dialysis, you know, for kidney failure. Some, like my daughter, she's an asthmatic. Thank God it's not that bad, you know. But I know moms who have to do nebulizer treatments with their kids every night. And, you know, I just thank God it wasn't that bad. But I needed to know, okay, who's going to help my kid? Who's going to treat her? Where? How? What's their reputation? You have to educate yourself on, you know, 
every aspect of what's going on. Now, am I saying you have to de- be Dr. Marcus Welby? Ooh, that aged me. <laughs> I was going to say, that might be a well. That aged me. <laughs> fortunately, my audience is older because oh. that's who's dealing with people with Alzheimer's and memory loss. But yeah, that was an right. old reference. <laughs> Oh, okay, cool, because I, I kind of way dated myself there. <laughs> but you don't have to be. You don't have to be Marcus Welby. Just know how that information is going to apply to you. Where can it be treated correctly? How, you know? And you have to ask questions. Educate yourself. Ask questions. Hey, Doc, I don't like this treatment. Is there another one possible? Or, doctor, what made you come to the conclusion that I have this versus any other disease? How's it going to affect your life? Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah. And those, you know, when you hear a diagnosis, like when I heard mine, I told you, I ran to Dunkin' Donuts. That didn't concern me about what I had to do right then. You have to cope with it and educate yourself and then start making your input known. Okay, Doc, I'm with you on this because I like to encourage partnerships between doctors and patients or caregivers. You know, hey, Doc, what are we going to do here? And I fortunately have a good doctor who understands me when I say that. And if you don't have a doctor that wants to be a partner with you, find another one. Yeah. Because it would be a detriment to your health and they will be a detriment to your treatment. I mean that. Oh, I fully believe that. Yeah. And third, get health care literate. Find out what you need to do, how to handle doctors, how to handle a diagnosis, which is the best insurance to choose. I mean, health literacy can mean everything from um, reading the labels on food in the store to reading medication bottles and knowing the difference between teaspoon and tablespoon. Yeah. There's a lot of medical errors that happen within that, you know, and you have to be able, because health literacy is defined basically as the degree of the capability of someone to read, process, and understand health information and make the best decisions for their care. Yeah, which now isn't we easy. I'm sorry? It isn't easy because it's never written in basic language. Never. Never. And that's an issue, too. Because when, like, I also have chronic pain. So when I went to my doctor, he brings this young little fresh face intern in. I knew he was even younger than me. <laughs> and then, you no, know, my older doctor. And the older doctor was letting him take over. And he said... I said, well, how is this pain med going to help me? Well, it goes up to your receptors and this and that, and, and it comes back down. And da, 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 da. I was like, English, not Dr. E's, English. The other guy was like, listen, it's going to block your pain receptors. Cool. <laughs> Explain it to me in a way that I understand so I don't have to walk out of my appointment intimidated and ashamed that I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, and a good question to ask about pain meds is they affect your brain. That's how it blocks the pain. And for somebody like me, I don't know that if I mentioned it to you, but my mom has Alzheimer's. I am 100% convinced that her mother had undiagnosed Alzheimer's. And I know from family stories that my great grandmother also had no memory at the end of her life. So that's not a good thing. So for me personally... I am very wary of anything that would, that alters my brain because I don't right. really think it's a good idea. I mean, if, if I, like I had to have surgery to fix the broken collarbone, I didn't have a, I mean, well, I did have a choice, but it wasn't really a great choice. I got to wait to see if it healed, but I looked at the x-ray and I didn't have to have a medical degree to realize the way it broke wasn't going to, wasn't going to fix itself very well. You know, but right. it's like I would never – I would not at this point in my life undergo any kind of anesthesia for anything other than an absolute necessity. Right. And even then I would question whether or not we could do something 
that didn't alter my brain because it's it's kind of scary. I've had a concussion. They said I didn't have a concussion when I crashed on my bike. That's mm. questionable. I knocked myself out, so that wasn't good. Right. So, you know, it's you know, then I had some anesthesia, so it's like, okay, we've we've played enough brain roulette for the next couple of decades. So right. I that's a good question for people to think about is, you know, pain medications affect your brain. That's how they work. And right. you might want to talk to your doctor if you have a family history like mine to, you know, maybe there's oh. something else you could do. Most definitely. Most definitely. And I can understand, you know, your hesitation in it. I really, really can because there's meds out there. You know, you see these med commercials and they're like, oh, this pill is going to make you so happy. And here are the side effects, death, <laughs> uh, suicidal thoughts, uh, brain alteration, loss of hearing, loss of bowels, loss of everything. But you'll be happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always laugh at those commercials because it's like there's one for um, like overactive bladder and the side effects yes. are way worse than the overactive bladder. Exactly. Like, I'm like no thanks. I'll just deal with, you know, with old lady yeah. bladder. That little annoying thing is not going to keep pulling me into the bathroom, okay? Yeah. I don't like that at all. <laughs> but these these are things that happen every day and a lot of us, which brings me to my third tip, a lot of us don't take our health and health care seriously. I agree your health, with that. Your health is your biggest treasure, as much as we've all taken it for granted at times. It is. Because, you know, like say maybe one night you slept wrong and you wake up and your neck is really bothering you and then you can't twist and turn the way you would normally. We really don't know how much we should appreciate something until it's messed up or gone. Oh yeah. You Try know? breaking your collarbone and you don't have use of an arm oh. for weeks. Oh, <laughs> I, I couldn't have did that. I, I'd go stir crazy. It was not fun. <laughs> and I, I was blessed 90% of the time when a cyclist crashes because you reach out to brace yourself, you break your dominant arm. I broke my left one, which I'm oh. right handed. So that was, that was a benefit in some respects, but I also carry everything on, I know my purse, my camera gear, I'm a pack mule. Everything goes on my left side. And mm -hmm. so that was a challenge. Oh, definitely. I bet. And I bet. Now it's like, um, because I have a, a plate that, you know, to screw the pieces of bone back together, sometimes yeah. it's cranky and I don't like it, but yeah. I, I knew just recovering from that surgery. I was like, I, I don't think I want to have the plate taken out because then I got to go through this all again. And that was no fun. And then thinking about, you know, having to be under anesthesia and they do a nerve block when they work that close to your neck. I was like, mm, I probably should just deal with it. So yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. You know. I understand. I understand completely. And that's your choice. Yeah. You know? And when you take your health care seriously and you educate yourself, you realize, wait a minute, I've got choices. I don't have to just go along with what the doctor says and how he says it. My grandmother... I think she was the last of that generation where the doc, whatever this doctor said, it was the gospel. You could not go against it. You could not question it. Nothing. But I really, in my heart, believe had she started questioning her doctors or had she had like an advocate to go with her to appointments, I, I truly believe in my heart she would have lived longer. I don't know if it would have been till now, but she definitely would have lived longer. Did you Somebody's got to be there to run point. Right. Did you ever read um, Steve Jobs' book? I not, can't remember when it came out, but his wife, she basically was like his health care manager slash advocate. She was the, the center of the wheel between all of his doctors. So if somebody mm -hmm. like Steve Jobs, with all of his millions of dollars of money, I mean, he could and afford. Brilliant. Yeah, if he could afford whatever he needed healthcare-wise, 
she still had to advocate and and be the go between between mm-hmm. all his doctors. And I thought, you know, it's a, it was it was fortunate for him she could do that. But mm-hmm. how how sad that even somebody with his creative genius and money I mean, you'd think that these doctors would be doing everything they can to, you know, to save him. You know, they'd they'd be in the hall discussing things together instead of leaving it up to his poor wife. No, no, no. It's up to you. You have to be the one to go to be the liaison between doctors and patient or that. But I do that as well. Um, Some of my services include that as well. Um, you know, speaking with doctors, getting them all together. Okay, let's everybody get on the same page. It's called care coordination, and it's a module in one in my program as well. Care coordination. Um, you know, once you get past the education part and ex- opening your mind, and not you know taking your health or health care for granted anymore, you've got to get everybody on the same page. Like I said, I went through a lot in 2014. I had so many doctors. It was unbelievable. It became a career just planning and going to doctor's appointments. Really? Oh, I believe you know? it's from people I've talked to, and it's it's insane. Yes, it shouldn't. It is should not be that way. And and right. one of the things I mentioned, this friend from the gym, her mom refuses to take a taxi or an Uber or have the neighbor take her. It's always got to be this one daughter. She's the only one that right. lives nearby. The other siblings are not. I don't think they're even in the same state. And it it frustrates me because it's like. Her mom doesn't care that she's sucking up this poor gal's life. And that just makes me crazy. But, you know, she yeah. also allows her mother to do it, too. So, you know, Yeah, like, family dynamics I don't do. Yeah, no, <laughs> Those are there. I, I'm there to listen to her, and that's about it. Because, you know, there's times I would tell her, you know, you tell, give your mom an option. Because she'll bemoan that, well, I couldn't, I didn't make it to the exercise class because... My mom insists on going to the doctor at 10 o'clock. And I'm like, then you give her an option. You can have a doctor appointment at this time or that time. But your specific time doesn't fit into my schedule. And she just kind of makes excuses. So I'm like, well, okay. If you're not going to stand up for yourself, then it's it's not going to change. But And I, I can see that people, some people like her might need you know, a liaison like you, because if she can't stand up to her mom, she's not gonna be able to stand up to doctors. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I'm going to tell you, she's on a quick road to burnout. Oh yeah. I mean, fortunately her mom doesn't live with her, but yeah, she's, I, I worry about her. She's probably about 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. It seems like all, cause because I work from home, I go to the gym when the retired and older people go. <laughs> so early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not there at five thirty. I'm still sleeping. You know, when all oh, those yeah. working stiffs got to go to the gym. You know, so I see the the older children dealing with geriatric parents that aren't cooperative. You know, and a lot of it's like when your health isn't great and you don't feel good, you're like, don't give me, don't give me no lip. Just do what I need. So right, I, I can totally right. see that I'm too. Still your mother, exactly. <laughs> oh, I hate. I don't quite get that from my mom. I did have to take her shopping. Um, I made my sister do it this last time, but a couple. The last time I took her shopping for clothes, she kept saying, "How did how did the roles get reversed? Why? How come you're taking care of me?" And fortunately, through the support group and and just kind of out of desperate self self-salvation I I came up with telling her you know I'm not taking care of you you know you're retired you know it's good that other people can and help do things for you right so I try to turn the tables a little bit because when she makes that comment you know how come you're taking care of me or how it just I use the phrase it's like a death by a thousand cuts you know she doesn't realize what she's saying is painful because 
Right. You know, her mind is not good. You know, it's diseased. And she had no intentions of being hurtful, but it is. And I have to deal with it. And that's how I deal with it is just by trying to steer her focus in a different, slightly different direction that it fits the reality. But it's, you know, because, I mean, I was taking her shopping, but she was still somewhat picking things out. You know, she was trying them on. It's not like she's an invalid. She's still very physically fit. It's just her mind is not. <laughs> I've found that, like, people that have Alzheimer's and a lot of other dementias, they are healthy as a horse. Yeah. Some of them walk I, and walk yeah. and walk. They yeah. need new carpet at the care community, I swear. Partly it was dirty, dirty, dirty. Not My mom's dog didn't help, but... Some of them, they walk around and around. It's it's basically like a square with this beautiful courtyard in the center that they can go in and out of because it's fully, you know, enclosed by the building. And some of these patients, not patients, residents, they go around and around and around. And, yes. like, I don't know how they, they don't starve to death because they just walk constantly. I'm there for two hours. I never see them sit down. Yeah. And I don't know how the, well, the staff must just kind of mentally tune it out because I would think that would be exhausting just to just to be in the same vicinity of somebody that doesn't ever settle down. Yeah. You know, it's tough. It is. It really And I know from people in my support group they've got family members that don't settle down and they're trying to figure out how to how to handle it and how to help them and it's ugh, it's crazy. It's sad it because my support group keeps getting bigger every month. I'm glad people are going, but I'm sad that the support group is necessary. Absolutely. I understand completely. It, it saddens me that services like mine are necessary, but they are, you yeah. know. And they're going to become more people. necessary as the population keeps aging. Not only that, they said by 2020, $200 billion alone of $3 trillion is going to be specifically for dementia. Yeah, two hundred billion dollars. I was in a, um, a you know breakout session at our convention. Um, they were talking about peace through brain health, which is kind of a strange combination. But they were talking about the global epidemic of dementias overall, not just Alzheimer's. And this right. one um, psychiatrist was saying, I think that she was a psychiatrist or psychologist, was saying if we could prevent the onset of symptoms for one year, we nearly will, will take out nearly 10 billion people. 10 billion? 10 million. Now I should have brought that stat up. One of those two numbers, a huge number of people will be mm -hmm. prevented from going down that path. Just by delaying symptoms for one year through doing things like, you know, reading labels. I've tried to take all the chemicals out of my life that I, you know, possibly can. You know, right. we eat really healthy. I exercise. We've made some alterations so that we're both sleeping better. You know, right. and then advocating with your health care is obviously a huge component of that. Because, you know, like I said, I've got three generations of of cognitive impairment behind me, I, I would like not to be the fourth. And I want my sister to be the fourth or either of our daughters to go down that path. So, you know, and my dad's mom is a hundred and she's perfectly fine. Her only issue is uh, mostly blind from glaucoma, but mentally and physically you would not know she's a hundred. It's just sick. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hoping yeah. I have that genetics and I look at how she's kind of conducted her life and I, you know, I, so I try to take lessons from the way she's lived and move forward with the knowledge that we have, like we've talked about today to, you know, even if, even if I only prevent having mental issues a year or two years or five years, it's still a huge difference. Absolutely. My mom's only 75. Oh, geez, that's nothing. No, and her mom lived to 91. Now, she did not have memory loss and starting until she was my mom's age. So the memory doctor did suggest that my mom probably wouldn't live 10 years. But, mm -hmm. you know, 
it's it's hard to believe when she doesn't even get a cold. I mean, they've had multiple. They the assisted living side of the community had the flu so bad um, that they had basically locked down the whole building. They closed the dining room. They were delivering meals to all of the residents' apartments. The memory care residents could not go over to the assisted living side for um, the hairdresser or any of the activities. I mean, it was like like jail lockdown. That's how bad the flu was. My mom doesn't even get a cold. It's like yeah, she's just really healthy. And she just doesn't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I know that yeah. you know down the road there'll be. That'll that'll change just from age and, you know, the disease of Alzheimer's. And it'll be nice to know, you know, and I'm definitely excited to hear about your online courses. I do a lot of those for other things, so I'll definitely be looking into those. You know, that way my sister and I are armed when mom needs more advocacy for her health. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm in the process of putting in them into audio form so that you could buy one lesson or buy them all. You could buy one track or you can buy all 20. You know, I'm putting it uh, that way so that people, you know, can look at it when they get ready. You know, this is part of your their education too. you know, figuring out, OK, what am I going to do? Which lends into a bonus tip I have for you. OK, bonus tip. Plan well into the future. Now, don't get me wrong. I know anything can happen to us at any time, but you can still plan for your healthcare future. And that comes through having a proxy. Actually, I recommend two proxies, one and a backup. These are the people that are going to stand up for you if it comes to a situation where you can't communicate your wishes for care. Yeah, they they should have copies of all of your advanced directives, whether it's a power of attorney, whether it's a uh, do not resuscitate order for the hospital, whether it's um, yes, you know, you can give me bloodborne products or nutrition or not. And people need to be aware of how you feel. And it must be in writing. It's Definitely. got to be in writing and signed by you. You know, I've seen people who had uh, napkins. I don't want any treatment. And it was accepted. It was accepted. Hmm. That person wasn't deemed, you know, with any kind of dementia or cognitive impairment. It was accepted. I don't want any treatment. You know, and people, you know, leave that in a kind of fly by night zone because, again, no one wants to deal with their, you know, health or mortality unless they absolutely have to. And I get that. But I have a 13 year old and I'm planning on being here to annoy her and her kids for a very, very, very long time. You know, but I have my wishes already written. I have it on the computer. They're already done. I've given copies to my friends. You know, listen, this is what I want to happen, you know? And people have to, in order to keep your power, your healthcare input, your power, your whatever it is, you have to be sure that you're planning for now and into the future. Whatever that means for you, culturally, spiritually, um, financially, you have to be prepared because healthcare doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Everyone's going to have that inevitable emergency type healthcare situation. I've been there, believe me, yeah. you know. But if there's, like, for example, my grandmother, she did her advanced directives on her deathbed two days before she died. That must have been hard. It was extremely hard. It was extremely hard. My mom was so devastated as caregiver. She was devastated, you know, and it re it nearly broke her down. And, you know, as you were saying about, you know, it's usually one kid that's drafted. My mom, my grandmother had six kids and they were all local except one. So what are you guys doing to help? 
Yeah. It always falls on one or two kids. I've seen that in nursing facilities. This one lady, she had 10 kids. Oh, Lord. One came all the time. One. And they could have took her home if they wanted to. All they needed was some home modifications. They didn't want to. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, there's a lot of factors that go into all of these decisions. Like I had a, uh, I had a gentleman on my case. So he had 13 kids. Oh my. <laughs> None of them came. Oh my. That's terrible. None of them. They were like, he was abusive. You know, he was, you know, drunk a lot and all. I mean, it's so much to have to try and consider. And in it, you have to be a realist. You know, us November babies are realists. Yes, so, we are. Yeah, you know, so you have to really look at your situation and be like, man, you know, there may not be anybody there for me. I haven't been the best person. You still have to plan ahead if you want to keep your health care power. I agree. So. And you need to talk about it with family because that was – my dad was good at planning. There were some bumps. They have a trust. It was very obvious what happened with the trust upon his death, but it wasn't real clear what happened. He died. Mom is you know legally incompetent to, to handle these things. We actually right. had to pay a lawyer to read through the trust – to find where it said that, yes, my sister and I were the su- successive trustees for my mom. Because we were at one point thought we were going to have to go to court and go through all that nonsense to get her declared incompetent, blah, 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 so that we could deal with all the stuff guarded. that needed to be dealt with. Which, thankfully, I don't know exactly why. It was like on page one of his part of the trust who the trustees were, but it was like buried on hers. But thankfully, you know. My sister found yeah. an attorney who was who who you know didn't charge us an arm and a leg to to find it, and thankfully it was there. But you know it was just it delayed things, and it's I don't right. never understand why my dad didn't discuss it with her or me or better yet both of us. You know? Well, they're from a different time. You know, the man handled everything back then. You know, it's a, it was a different time. You know, that's the only thing I could possibly think of. I mean, now, you know, I don't think wives are just going to, like, let it be handled without them. And I'm not saying your mom did that. It was just a different time. Oh, he's got it. Okay, well, it's under control kind of thing. And obviously, as her disease progressed, she couldn't. You know, she couldn't come to me and say, well, hey, you know, this is what your dad and I have been discussing because she didn't remember what they'd been discussing. I was just really surprised. He had made assumptions that she would come live with me, and he was not ever aware of a time in my life that I actually had a spare bedroom because my daughter moved out a month before he died, and he didn't know that because he was on hospice and his mind was I don't know where. But he never talked to me about it. He never – it was it was just assumed that she'd come live with me. And it's like right. the more I thought about it in doing this podcast, I actually did a three-part series on, you know, because not everybody is blessed like my sister and I. And sometimes you got to right. have your parents in your home. There are some serious safety issues I don't know how I could address. I back up right. to hundreds of acres of open space. If you are chatting away in my kitchen and lean up against my range, you can get the burners turned on without hardly touching them, which means I'd have to either somehow prevent the stove from being turned on so easily, or I'd have to replace the range, and those aren't cheap. I mean, it's just it's the, the just making the home safe. I mean, forget the fact that I didn't have a room for my mom. I don't know where I was supposed to put her, but you know, I didn't have a room for her. And, you know, the more my husband and I have talked about it to kind of come to terms with the fact that he never discussed it with us or me, we just, what we determined that we think he had cognitive impairment that we weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. Um, Mom was so bad that, you know, I I think what we can look back on now and say, "Eh, I'm not sure his mind was as good as we thought. So that's kind of how I comfort myself with that. But just the, just trying to make your home safe for somebody with 
cognitive impairment or mobility issues. It's just, right. whew, you know, it's a lot. And so I, I, oh, yeah. when I do these conversations, I do tell people, you know, you got to talk to your family. And if, you know, my sister and I were not, are not close. So I can see why my dad didn't sit us down together and talk to us, but he could have talked to her and talked to me and, you know, I, we, he could have talked to one of us at least. And he, right. he didn't. And I, I, I regret that for all of us because I think, I think his last couple of months would have been better. You know, every, everybody would have been better off if we had not been plunged into the panic of a nightmare of, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Right. We could have right. said, okay, you don't want to go back on dialysis. So we need to talk to the doctor to know what to expect. And this is what we right. need to do with mom. And, you know, we wouldn't have been making decisions in 24 hour time frames or, you know, immediately right. it's like, whew. so that's right. my tidbit for everybody is definitely plan, plan as far in advance as you can and talk to as many family members and, and not necessarily blood family members. If you've got really close right. friends, talk to right. them too, because your family might need support. They might be like, well, I know. I knew my dad did not want to be on dialysis, and I knew what his wishes were, and it was still hard to call the hospice people. Oh, yes. That doesn't take away from all of that. Like, I knew my grandmother was dying. I knew this was it. You know, but when it actually happened, it was still like a slap in the face. You know, it, 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 that stuff is difficult. It really is. Because not only are you mourning a part of your life, and your loved one's life, you know, you're kind you have to get adjusted to this new normal so quickly. And then healthcare, okay, how are we gonna get paid? Somebody yeah. tell me how we're we gonna get paid, you know? That doesn't help. That doesn't help matters at all. No. You know? And it, especially those. Uh, I remember you asked me a question earlier. How can those with um that are early in the disease? Um, do things. Planning. Number one, planning. I would get, if somebody, oh God forbid, but if somebody told me that today, that I had that diagnosis, I'd be at a lawyer within a week. Look, this is everything. You know, this is how I want this. This is how I want that. And make sure your family has copies. Make sure all your providers have copies. So that's part of care coordination. So everyone is on the same page. Listen, we need to, we know what we need to do with Mrs. Smith. So let her be, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so much. And that's why I made my um, powerful patient partner program so general. I made information that so many different people can use. While I focus on patients and caregivers, this could work for veterans, parents of disabled children, adult children of the elderly, orphan elders. There's so many people that can benefit from knowing how to navigate health care in the best way possible for them. You know, that's my whole thing. I want people to go out there and win because it's a game. It's a, it's big business. Yeah. You know? that's, that's not right. I mean, I don't know that I want our government running the health care because Lord knows they can't take care of themselves. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm, I'm with that's people on that thought, show. but <laughs> it is, you know, and I think, and I don't know this for a hundred percent, but I think our government gets, really great care and they're not aware that the rest of us are like you know David and Goliath battles against the system I don't think they're fully aware of how bad it really is because they don't have to live it I would agree with you up until the advent of social media now you're seeing it for example even with racism yeah. You know, a lot of people really didn't believe that we as black people were going through this on a regular basis. But now you see it. Now it's there. You know, it's a kind of a joke in our community about police brutality, because eventually you will know someone that's happened to. That's just a fact of being black in America, you know, and I don't want to go off on a race tangent, but. <laughs> No, I really don't. I don't want to go off on a race tangent, but our our government isn't addressing that. 
That's they're true. not addressing, you know, they're not addressing caregivers. They're not addressing patients. And, you know, but you can see it. It's right there, you know, but they refuse to see it. Yeah, that's my I'm I'm terrified of the of the time. And I hope this doesn't come of when Alzheimer's and autism bankrupts our country because there's 16 over 16 million unpaid family caregivers of people with cognitive impairment. So those are people like me that are out of the workforce or out of it. They're not fully involved because you can't be. So they're not contributing to their household income. They're not contributing to the community because their life has been sucked into caring for this one person. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's my mom. You know, she took care of me. She diapered me. She bathed me. But when we're parents, as you know, We know they're going to outgrow the diaper stage, the pacifier stage, you know, all those stages. They're going to grow up and be 13-year-olds that need, you know, $500 of back-to-school supplies or books. (laughs) You know, it's not going to be, you know, like me. I said I'm 51, and, you know, my husband and I still work. And if my mom lived to 91 like her mom, I'd be in my 70s before I would be, quote, free. And then who knows what my life would be like. So it's like, you know, I'm I'm thankful every day that she is in a good place, that we can afford this good place. She's happy. We're all happy and it's all good. And I I feel horrible for the people who can't be in our position. And that's why I'm trying to do what I can to, to help spread knowledge. Whatever I learn, I'm trying to spread because, you know, like you, you've been in the system and you know, you know more than I do, and so I'm really looking forward to your your online courses because I'm sure that'll help me too. You know, but it's just I, I fear for a day when people just throw up their hands and say, "I'm sorry, Mom's going on the corner because I can't do this anymore. I'm out of money. She's out of money. We're getting evicted." I mean, it's just I'm terrified that our, it's going to bankrupt the country or the world. Absolutely, absolutely, and, gonna have and to it do is something. so easy as a caregiver to become overwhelmed, confused, and destroy yourself. I know so many caregivers that have died from the stress before the loved one that they were caring for. Yeah, the statistic for that is 65% of caregivers die or are hospitalized before the person they're caring for dies. 65%. Something's really, really really wrong with that. Yeah. There's no way that we should be spending three times what they do in the UK and not have adequate care and resources. Resources are a part of the healthcare experience. You can't do it all alone. You just can't. And people need help How do I find these resources? Some caregivers don't have time to take a shower. Exactly. You know, and it just is so sad to me. That's why I focus on patients and their caregivers, because it's so important that they have a voice and that they have value in the system. But you're not going to it's not going to be given to you. You're going to have to take it. You're going to have to take it. And that's what my courses help people do. I'm going to let you know pretty much everything I know. My friend told me I have a moral obligation to this. And I do. From my heart and soul, I believe I do. I have to, you know, tell people what I know. And if it helps people, great. Great. I just want to shout. My, my, my problem is being able to get the word out there. Because, again, no one wants to deal with their health. Who wants to deal with that? No, we don't want to think about it until we have to. Right. And then when you have to, it's already too late. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what people don't understand. It was rough for me, you know, that year, 2014. It was rough for me. My emotions, I fell into a depression, you know. I mean, you know, I had to mourn who I used to be because I'm not her anymore. And that's hard enough 
without having to worry about somebody breathing down your neck. Okay, what's your insurance card, honey? They come in with that little roll away computer. Yeah. Oh, honey, well, yeah, your insurance, your insurance, your insurance. You know? What happened to real care? First, do no harm. Yeah. Oh, forgive me. This is not anger. This is passion. Oh, I believe you know? it. Because I'm just, you know, my daughter always is like, you sound angry. And I'm like, no, they discharged this lady out of the hospital and just threw her on the street. That angers me genuinely. Nobody should be treated like that. You know, in California, I don't know if you heard uh, years back, they were just discharging patients to Skid Row. Yeah, I, th- I think I've heard that. And they and they were leaving them there. You where are you gonna? Uh, you don't care because you don't. They don't have an address that you can send a satisfaction survey to. Go to hell. Ugh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, me. no, this passion is good because that's how. Um, that's the only way things are gonna change. Is like you know I've learned a lot, and I you know because like you said, some caregivers don't have time to take a shower. They don't have time to do a deep dive on the internet like I've been able to do. I start researching a topic, something that comes up with my mom or a a listener says, hey, you know, how do I convince my mom to stop driving? And I'm still trying to figure out how to make that into an episode because I can't get anybody at the DMV to do that. But (laughs) I'll find somebody that will be able to help and say, you know, because it's not easy. None of like I couldn't drive when I had a broken collarbone because first off the seatbelt pressed on the broken bone. That was painful. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't because everything was stiff. I couldn't look over my shoulder. And so my husband, you know, when I was on the mend and able to go to the gym and do some things, but not, you know, I couldn't obviously do weights or anything. There was one day that my daughter and my husband looked at looked at each other and went, oh, who's taking mom to the gym? And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm getting thrown under the bus. And I drove that day. And I remember thinking, this is probably not a good idea, you know, because I'm not sure that I'm looking over my shoulder enough to be safe. And, but, you know, right. I still did it. <laughs> right. And my husband right. drove with a broken leg once because he had to get to work. And the gal he was carpooling with, that just got kind of, it got a little tricky and a little inconvenient. So he's like, oh, the heck with it. It's, it's my left leg that's broken. I drive with my right foot. It's no big deal. But so talking somebody out of driving is a definite challenge. And if you can't do that, it's hard to get people to talk about, well, what's going to happen when you can't make decisions or you, you know, you can't do things and somebody else has to help you do it. Nobody wants to think about that. It's just depressing. So we have to, we have to be the voices for, for people like us that have been there and we have to share our knowledge because that's the only way things will get better. Right. Right. Absolutely. And when you try to take somebody's driving skills, you're not just taking their driving skills. You're taking their independence. And I don't know anybody who wants to give that up. Anybody. I don't care what's going on, you know. So it really um, I, I encourage people, educate yourself, have an open mind to getting care and don't take your health or your health care for granted, please, you know, and plan well into the future and make sure that you, that your wishes are maintained. That's the only way you're going to maintain your health care power. And that's a really good message because that makes it a little bit easier to say, okay, yeah, I'm going to sit down and, and I'm going to think this through and then I'm going to talk about it to my family. So I don't end up, you know, in some terrible, you know, long-term care facility that, you know, like the ones that Medicare pay for, I would never even consider sending my mother to. I wouldn't send a dog to half of them. (laughs) You're no kidding. And, you know, and it's just, so I like that. I like that way of thinking about it. It's the only way you're going to get to have your wishes be upheld at least as Mm -hmm. much as possible. Because I know my mom did not want to move into a memory community. She Mm -hmm. had nothing but negative thoughts about, you know, that kind of, you know, people call it a facility, but that's, that's not the term that the industry likes to use. It's, it is a community and it's actually been very beneficial for her because she can Mm -hmm. sit there and talk endlessly about the same thing 
like the new rug with the buttons of all different colors in her room yesterday. <laughs> she right, can, right. She can talk endlessly with somebody about it, and they don't get frustrated. They don't roll their eyes. They don't have negative body language. You know, they don't tune her out. You know, and it's it's actually really good for her. And I, I wished that she had had, she'd had the foresight to maybe check into them and say, you know, my mind is getting pretty bad, and I'm not yet seventy and. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't want to be a burden on my kids, but I don't know what other options are. I wish she'd investigated options, but I know that their age group, that's not what they did. And, you know, my sister and I felt like horrible people the day we moved her in. I know we did. Of and, course. You know, and I knew it was for the best, but it, huh, it was, it that was ripped worse. your heart out. Yeah, it was worse than the day my dad died. Yeah. Because she begged and she pleaded out. and she cried. And yeah. I was like, honey, you won't last a week at my house because one of us will kill the other one. That's just how it will be. Yeah, let's be real. Yeah. You know. Let's be real. You know, you can't. You know, I have one kid for a reason because we got through the terrible, you know, we got through the, the newborn phase and we got through the terrible twos and we got through the clingy fours. And, you know, there was no way. I'm like, by the time she was five and we thought maybe we might be able to afford a second one, which... We wouldn't have been able to, but, you know, we're always so optimistic. I was like, mm-hmm. hell no, I'm not doing this again. I've lived through all mm-hmm. those days. That's fine. And right. I have no regrets. So, you know, right. I, I knew I know what I can handle. And dealing with my mother 24-7 was not not on that list. Right. And besides health care, you know, Elder care is a separate animal. And I have the benefit of having experience in elder care as well, having worked in nursing homes and aging agencies. When you, when all it takes is a fall Mm -hmm. and you're right in the middle of it, you're in the eye of the storm. And so many people are not prepared for that. Two things that my um, courses also teach. What kind of patient are you? You have to do some self-reflection. And find out what kind of patient you are, because that'll dictate the course of your health care when you partner with your doctor. For I example, can... I like a doctor who's on it, like, OK, Tiffany, let's take this diabetes and kick its ass and let's do this. And this is what you got to do. And da, 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 da. How do you feel about that? OK, doc, I don't know about this med or this or that. Let me ask these questions that I need to ask kind of thing. I like that relationship. Some people are good with the doctor being an authoritarian and saying, do one, two, and three, come back in six weeks. Some people are cool with that. I'm not. That's why it would be burdensome if I had a doctor like that. Then things wouldn't get done because it would turn into a clashing of our personalities. No one needs that in their health care. That's why they have to know what kind of patient they are and what they're dealing with. So I teach that and I teach preparedness, preparedness, preparedness. Education and preparedness are key in your health care. And that's yes. why I try to teach all these things. And I make it general, like I said, for any, you know, for everybody to be able to read. You know, again, I'm still working on the audio lessons and like I want to be done and launching by November 1st, which is open enrollment. But, you know, I've I've worked very hard on it and I've given it my all. Even my daughter knows. (laughs) And, um, you know, it's it's just it's just the right thing for me to do. I have to do it. I have to. Well, give all the listeners your website so that they can they can partake in your knowledge before you get that all launched. Not that that's far off, but they might need something today that they sure. can get from you. Again, I offer um, supportive phone calls um, through my website and I offer care planning, you know, for those that need help with caregiving or disease management. And my uh, website is LBB, Larry Boy Boy, healthcareadvocacy.com. I'm on there. There's ways to contact me. Um, You can email me at Tiffany at LBB healthcare advocacy.com. I'm available to talk. Um, You know, I talk with families on a regular basis about things 
you know, they can do and how I can help them. So just uh, contact me. I'm here to help. I'm here to serve the community. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure that that link is on my website and on the show notes so people don't have to write it down if they're because I always listen to podcasts while I'm doing stuff. I don't have time to write things down in the middle of cooking or laundry or whatever. So that link will right. definitely be on the website. And Terrific. I really appreciate this. I know I told you probably about 30 minutes and it's been almost two hours. So. It's all, it's okay. It's, it's a, okay. It's a very important topic and I'm glad we connected on Instagram. Like you said, social media is really changing the dynamics of our world and you know there's a lot of negative with it but this is obviously a positive use for that and i'm glad i reached out and i'm glad you accepted and i hope you have a really good evening you too thank you so much thank, thank you. you for thinking of me and i hope we can keep in touch and definitely. you know what to do what we can possibly do to make things better definitely it definitely takes a community okay. Can I just say one thing? Definitely. This is the absolutely best, best, best podcast I've ever been on. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you know why? Because I just spoke. That's all. You know, when I'm on other podcasts, it's like a, you know, a back and forth question and answer. But all we did was have one big, great conversation. And I think that's how it needs to be. That's so the kind I enjoy. Much. Like I said, I, right. I listened to podcasts and then one day it was like, duh, why don't I find one on, on Alzheimer's? And I went to Apple podcast and I typed in Alzheimer's and, and I came up, there was a, a handful of them and I thought, huh? So I listened to a few and none of them were worth listening to a third time. A couple of them got a second time. There are a couple that I listened to mostly because they're interesting, but they're very technical. They're not helpful for how to deal with my mom. They're just more of a, here's what's going on in the research side of things, which yeah. does interest me. So I just figured, Hey, it can't be that hard. And so I just started checking into how to do a podcast and I create what I like to listen to. Hopefully I will get enough listeners like me that, you know, that this is helpful to lots of people. Great. That's awesome. That really is. I appreciate it very much. Well, you're um, welcome, and thank you for being on the pod with me today. I hope this conversation and Tiffany's passion will inspire you to become more healthcare literate and enable you to become an advocate, not only for your own health, but for our loved ones as well, your loved ones. I guess it goes without saying that the more quality care we can get for ourselves and our loved ones and even friends and neighbors, the better our lives will be and the less frustrations and difficulties we'll have. So I encourage you to check out Tiffany's website. The link is in the show notes. Just click that little link. And I will also alert all of you when her courses are available. They sound terrific and I'm definitely going to be checking them out as well. One last thing I'd like to mention, there is a new page on the Fading Memories podcast website. It's linked also in the show notes. It's called Favorite Things. Currently, it links to all of the books that I've read in learning how to live with Alzheimer's with my mom and help take care of her. I found all these books tremendously helpful, and that is why I created this page, so that you had a one-stop location to order whatever you think might help you, and I hope that you take a look at it. Once again, thanks so much for listening, and I will talk to you again next week. There's so much useful information out there and so much we need to know to take care of our parents and our own families. And I know sometimes it's really hard to gather all this information together in a short period of time in a way you can access easily. And that's the whole point of this podcast. I share what I've learned taking care of my parents and especially my mom and all the researching of information I do for these podcast episodes. I hope you're finding them useful and hopefully a little entertaining as well. If you are, could you do me a favor? Can you go to Apple iTunes and leave a rating or even a quick review? This is how new people find my podcast, and I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know about me. As always, I'll chat with you again next week. 
MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbk seniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400.